Bergson versus Einstein on time. This is actually going to be a bit of a, a multi-stream affair. There's a couple of ways we can go about this. The first is going to be... There's an excellent overview. A book I'm reading uh, right now, uh, given by Jimena Canales, who's a historian of uh, science. The book is The Physicist and the Philosopher, Einstein, Bergson, and the Debate that Changed Our Understanding of Time. And it's fantastically interesting so far. I'm learning a lot about Einstein and Bergson through it. Um, Jemena Canals gave a talk on Einstein's versus uh, Bergson's ideas of time and the debate they had. Um, so this will be the, the first dip we take into this on stream. Certainly not the last time I'll be talking about it. Uh, but she gives a really good overview. And this is a this is a point of particular interest to me. I've been reading a lot of Bergson lately. Um, so we'll be going back and forth with this over the next few weeks. Here we go. This is Jemena Canales. Canals? Canals? I should not pronounce her name. Um, Jemena Canals on uh, Einstein and Bergson on time. Specifically, Einstein versus Bergson on time. I'm a writer and a professor. And one of the. Earl Surfner from the beginning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk about, um, about my work and say a little bit about myself. I'm a historian of science, I'm a writer and a professor. And one of the things that I like to do as a historian of science is to analyze the history of, of facts, scientific facts. So one of my uh, colleagues, um, the sociologist Harry Collins, describes facts as ships in a bottle, arguing that they're carefully constructed to pretend to seem as if no one was there to build them. And another uh, wonderful um, philosopher and sociologist of science, Bruno Latour, describes facts as frozen vegetables. And he argues that, that facts need a bevy of support networks in order frozen to... Frozen vegetables? That wouldn't, be from, uh, that wouldn't be from this, would it? This is Latour's modern cult of the factors gods. That might be from no one has... We have never been modern, actually. I'm going to have occasion to actually dig through Latour soon, so I'm excited for that to thrive and to be around us. So with that, let me move on to the topic of my talk today. This is the book that I will be uh, talking about this debate, and it's a debate between Einstein and Bergson that took place in April 6, 1922. And I came to this story after finishing my first book, um, A Tenth of a Second, A History. And uh, this book has to, it analyzes why we became obsessed in the second half of the 19th century with measuring speeds of the order of a tenth of a second and much shorter than that. So I joke that I've written the longest book about the shortest time period <laughs> in history. And when I was concluding that book uh, towards the end of the chapter, I encountered an amazing document, and I, I think of myself as a historian of the 19th century, and I knew that one of the most prominent intellectuals of the 19th century was Henri Bergson. And um, uh, I encountered this document right here. This is a transcript of a meeting between philosophers that took place at the Société Française de Philosophie on that fateful day, um, 6 of April, 1922. And I was studying Bergson, as I mentioned, and what I found in this transcript is that this man, this philosopher, was in the same room with Albert Einstein, and they were discussing the nature of time. And we actually... Let me know if the audio is uh, loud enough for you, chat. We have a record of what he said and what the other person said and what um, uh, people in the audience uh, said. So the more that I looked into this moment, the, the more that I understood that it was a huge story. And one of the reasons why it became so um, important and frequently cited in primary sources of the early 20th century was that 
the, the debate was listed as one of the reasons why Einstein never got the prize, uh, the Nobel Prize for the theory of, um, of relativity. So the presenter of the prize um, uh, during his presentation speech said something, he said, it will be no secret that the famous philosopher Bergson in Paris has challenged um, the theory. And then he went on to explain that the theory of relativity pertained, that Bergson had argued that the theory of relativity pertained to epistemology. And therefore, it did not merit the prize for physics, which Einstein ended up getting for the photoelectric effect and for his work on Brownian motion, which were two areas that he had worked on, which are incredibly important for physics, but did, that did not juggle the imagination as much as relativity and hadn't brought to Einstein uh, fame as, as relativity had. So Einstein was kind of stubborn, and in the presentation speech, he decided to talk anyway about, about rel relativity. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew that, that Bergson was an extremely important and influential uh, philosopher, and he was even more famous than Einstein at the time, which is uh, very surprising given the fact that few of us have heard of him. These are some quotes. Uh, he was frequently compared to Socrates and Copernicus, Kant, Simon Bolivar, and my favorite, Don Juan. <laughs> John Dewey, somebody that you've heard about, um, admired him. Uh, um, he said that there was no problem would exhibit the same um, uh, uh, face before Bergson. William James, also somebody that you might, may have heard, us, heard, heard of, uh, admired Bergson. Uh, profoundly, he said that his work was a true miracle, the beginning of a new era, a sort of Copernican revolution, and I like that because obviously Einstein himself was uh, credited by making a Copernican revolution with respect to, uh, to time. Jean Let's take a quick divergence here. Um, this is an article that Brooks sent me a few days back. Um, I am entirely out of my depth when it comes to physics, so I'm... I'm I, I, I have no capacity to judge this, um, but it's short and it looks interesting. So we're gonna we're gonna go through this very quickly. <clears throat> this is published in uh, 2016. Last week's announcement. Here I'll make myself smaller so I'm not taking up the screen. Actually, what I should do, so I should move that to the side there. Last week's announcements of the of announcement of the direct direction detection. Jesus Christ. Last week's announcement of the direct detection of gravitational waves proved once again the enduring power of Albert Einstein's scientific vision. Once again, Einstein was right in that this theory accurately predicted the behavior of the world. But with last week's triumph, a deep and fascinating question arises. Could Einstein be right about his science and still be wrong about the broader context into which we humans put that science? Let me explain. There are a lot of reasons thinking about physics is worth the effort, from GPS to 3D printers, it's a subject yielding a lot of cool technology. And from flushing toilets to rising clouds, physics also explains a lot about the world around us. But there's another reason people love physics, the world we can't see. Physics offers radical new perspectives on what lies beneath, behind, and below our everyday experience. In this way, physics seems like more than just knowledge, it seems like truth with a capital T. But when science reaches the hairy edges of our experience, when it reaches outward to the boundaries of our abilities to describe the world, is there something else coming along for the ride? Together with the powerful abstract mathematics and the ingenious instrumentation, is there something beyond just the facts requiring special attention when physicists make their grandest claims about the cosmos? To be exact, is there a philosophy, a metaphysics, that goes beyond what the math and the data support? And if such background metaphysics is a metaphysic and if such background metaphysics exist, could it be wrong even if the theory itself is right in terms of experiments and data? The qu oh, here we go. I didn't even realize that. that. That was just serendipity. Actually directly referencing this book. There we go. We're, we're on point here. This question is at the heart of a fascinating book I've been reading called The Physicist and the Philosopher by Jemena Canals. It's a story about Albert Einstein, who needs no introduction, and Henry Bergson, who probably does. The French philosopher Bergson was far more famous than Einstein in the first two decades of the 20th century. The reason most folks these days know Einstein's name but not Bergson's is, for Canals, an important story in itself. 
It's the story of how science seemed to become the last word on everything, even on a topic as subtle, slippery, and difficult to pin down as time. It all began in 1922, when Einstein and Bergson met in an unplanned but fateful debate. Einstein had been invited to give a presentation in Paris on his theory of relativity. Time was central to Einstein's work. It was, however, also the central issue in Bergson's philosophy. Their conflicting views on the meaning of time set the scholars on collision course. So for Bergson, and this is just my sort of roughshod um, condensation of it as a non-expert, there is no past. There isn't like a, a, an existent timeline, so to speak, or anything that can be represented accurately spatially, um, except in abstraction. So you can symbolize, for example, past events and so on and so forth. But this is not to say that the past is an arrangement of, uh, of, of situations that can be arrayed in parallel, right? The time is not spatial. This is a very major point for Bergson. Um, Time is merely the fact of action itself. It is action. It's identical with movement. And so for Bergson, there isn't a future or a past in the way we think of when we think of like Doctor Who. Um, instead, there is simply a present into which the past is, as it were, a, a present which eats the future, and the past is simply rolled up into the present. Um, Einstein, of course, with the theory of relativity. Uh, oh my God talks of space-time. Um, I think what's crucial as well is that Bergson... Uh, so Bergson wrote a book actually contesting Einstein's theory, but not not on its own grounds, like not on scientific grounds. In fact, he, he makes it super clear. Actually, I'm gonna, just going to read this article because he this, this person goes right into it anyway. So, uh, so in the debate, uh, Bergson made it clear he had no problem with the mathematical logic of Einstein's theory or the data that supported it. But for Bergson, relativity was not a theory that addressed time on its most fundamental philosophical level. Instead, he claimed it was theory about clocks and their behavior. Bergson called Einstein out for missing the distinction. In Bergson's philosophy, there was something greater to time than just measurements. Time was so central to human experience that fully unpacking it meant going beyond mere accounts of clocks or even of psychological perceptions. Instead, time was intimately connected to the bedrock of what it means to experience the world. It was, in some sense, the essence of human being and hence of being itself. For Bergson, that meant purely scientific accounts could not exhaust time's meaning or importance. Partially because a purely scientific account has to be spatial. Um, or has to use a spatial, like, symbolization. So on that day in Paris, Bergson was not criticizing Einstein's theory. He was attacking a philosophy that had grown up around the theory. Actually, maybe I can find a good quote from uh, Time and Free Will, because there, there is a section here. That puts it rather pithily. Um, okay, here we go. I think this is it. Here we find ourselves in the same position. Okay. Thus, when we call the mind, when we call to mind the past, i.e., a series of deeds done, we always shorten it without, however, distorting the nature of the event which interests us. The reason is that we know it already. For the psychic state, when it reaches the end of the progress, which constitutes its very existence, becomes a thing which one can picture to oneself all at once. Here we find ourselves in the same position as the astronomer when he takes in at a glance the orbit which a planet will need several years to traverse. In fact, astronomical prediction should be compared with the recollection of the past state of consciousness, not with the anticipation of the future one. But when we have to determine a future state of consciousness, however superficial it may be, we can no longer view the antecedents in a static condition as things. We must view them in a dynamic condition. We must view them in a dynamic condition as processes, since we are concerned with their influence alone. Now, their duration is this very influence. Therefore, it will no longer uh, do to shorten future duration in order to picture its parts beforehand. One is bound to live this duration whilst it is unfolding. As far as deep-seated psychic states are concerned, there is no perceptible difference between foreseeing, seeing, and acting. Um, for the physicist, the same cause always produces the same effect. For a psychologist who does not let himself be misled by merely apparent analogies, a deep-seated inner cause produces its effect once for all and will never reproduce it. And 
If it is now asserted that this effect was inseparably bound up with this particular cause, such an assertion will mean one of two things. Either the antici either that the antici sorry, my jaw is like really stiff right now for some reason. Either that the antecedents I need to speak slowly. Either that the antecedents being given, the future action might have been foreseen, or that the action having once been performed, and the other action is seen under the given conditions to have been impossible. Um now we saw that both these assertions are meaningless. Da, 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 da. There was a section in here that was directly on the physical sciences and referenced them by name. We might have to do without, but that's okay. Damn, there was a really good line. And I, I'm sure I noted it. Nah, whatever. It's okay. We'll come back to it at some point. So, sorry. It was the theory's hidden metaphysics, Einstein's theory, that Bergson challenged. Bergson told Einstein that the only proper way to impact the full meaning of time and all its lived richness was through explicit philosophical investigations. Einstein, however, was not moved. In response to Bergson's challenges, the physicist lobbed his now famous grenade. The time of the philosophers does not exist, he told the audience. So what are the metaphysics of Einstein's theory? As you might imagine, one could fill a library with all the books out there trying to answer that question, but let's look at one powerful example. In relativity, space and time are no longer separate entities. Instead, they're replaced with a four-dimensional whole called space-time. But something very weird happens when you make that move. The remarkable thing about space-time is that it contains all the events that ever happened. Um, in fact, there's a line in here uh, talking about how Einstein sent... Um, a, uh, a letter of consolation to the family of a friend or a colleague who had died saying that uh, according, like, us physicists see this differently because the past in which this person was alive is as real as the present. So in this big 4D space-time representation of the universe, there's Julius Caesar getting stabbed and the Mets winning the 1969 World Series because it's all about the Mets, baby. Love the Mets. Let's go Mets. But the coffee you are going to spill on your pants at that meeting next Tuesday is there too. So is that moment when you watch the new president get inaugurated in January 2017. In fact, everything that will ever happen to you, including your death, is strung across space-time as a linked string of already existing events. This is why I feel like I'm dying constantly. Physicists call this your world line. So is this really how time works? Do all events really exist in this block universe of Einstein's relativity? Is everything that will ever happen already trapped in the 4D chamber of space-time? This view is sometimes called chrono-geodeterminism. The geo part comes becomes because Einstein's theory is already about the geometry of space-time. It's one example of a philosophical theory about the nature of reality that grows out of a related and validated scientific theory. It is literally metaphysics, and it's exactly the kind of thing Bergson was arguing against. For Bergson, and others at the time, there was a difference between the mathematical physics slash data and the higher order interpretation, the philosophy, you glued onto it. It's in this way that Einstein could be right and wrong at the same time. He's clearly right about the science, but he could be wrong about the interpretation of time attached to that science. The physicist Dave M M David Merman, sorry, once pointed out that we physicists have a way of turning our mathematical equations into things existing in the world. We take their success as describing aspects of the world, like the behavior of readouts in an experiment, to mean the equations are fully interchangeable for real things, often unseen, existing out there independently in the real world. But for Merman, the equations are always abstractions. They are immensely powerful and immensely useful stories we tell about the world that capture some essential truth but not all truth. And in spite of what one may think of Bergson's specific ideas about time as an Elan Vitel, sort of, it's, it's a, like life impetus is, is how it's sometimes translated, driving life and devolution forward. That's something weird that I don't fully understand, so I'm going to return to that at some point. I'm, I'm building up to creative evolution. 
um, there are other philosophical perspectives that take experience to be irreducible. In particular, the branch of philosophy called phenomenology takes a direct apprehension of the world as its main concern. From, phenolo from, phenom yeah, from phenomenology's perspective, scientific theorizing and investigation must come after the raw fact of our embodied experience. Martin Heidegger, a German phenomenologist, emphasized that the problem of being, which he crossed out, the problem of understanding the verb to be remained unsolved by science or philosophy. From this perspective, the rush to make science the adjudicator, the judge of all questions, meant the question of being had been entirely forgotten. Taken together, these perspectives point to, uh, and sorry to emphasize this, the question of being had been entirely forgotten. Taken together, these perspectives point to a possibility that I find really deeply intriguing. Um, this blog is dedicated to science and culture. In the debate between Bergson and Einstein, there is uh, perhaps a different way to approach the question about where science fits into the entire fabric of human experience. In particular, it points to what might be a new way of understanding that fabric. In this discussion, we might begin to see a new relationship between our immense capacities for understanding the world through scientific practice, while never forgetting that it's always we who do the understanding. Being human, being at the center of our own worlds, is an immense and beautiful mystery. The explanations of science are one route to plumb that mystery, but not the only route. If this is true, then what step do we take next? It's rather disappointing. I was hoping he would, like, go into it a little bit. But, yeah, whatever. All right. Let's uh, press on. Val, he would grade the philosophers, one could say, Descartes, Kant, and Bergson, Etienne Gilson, called the 20th century the age of Bergson. The greatest thinker in the world, the most dangerous man in the world, uh, an enchanter. Um, he was credited for saving people from committed su committing suicide after they went to his lectures. They, they decided <laughs> not, not, uh, not, not to do it. There were mystical pilgrimages to his house in Switzerland, in saint -Serre. And uh, people even went to the barber shop to look at his, the locks of his hair, which is a very interesting contrast with the obsession that we have around Einstein's uh, brain. So they're both sort of objects of, uh, of fascination. <clears throat> have Lord Balfour, Prime Minister of England, uh, talking about Bergson. Theodore Roosevelt wo wrote an entire article on him. He was accused it wasn't all good, it wasn't all praise. This is uh, Einstein's brain, by the way. He's literally a brain in a vat. No, I got off my screen, what I felt this. Nobody likes you. He was accused of um, uh, mounting an insurgence against reason. He was placed on the Catholic Church's index. His relationship to the Catholic Church is very interesting because although he was placed on the index, then he got uh, rehabilitated and became seen as a uh, Catholic friendly philosopher, although he was Jewish. Like, uh, like Einstein. <laughs> uh, the, the book that really turned things for Bergson was the 1907 book, Creative Evolution. And uh, that book is, is, is about Darwin. And, uh, and particularly, it's about certain interpretations of Darwinism that do not allow for the creation of the new. Uh, uh, seeing evolution as a mixing up the same pieces that's already there was something that, that, uh, that he, didn't, he didn't like. You had 2000. Uh, Jelma says, President Sunday, the problem is physicists have no idea they're positivists by definition via the fact they're using data and empirical frameworks. Es essentially, yeah. The students uh, in a, um, a city college in, in New York, it was wrong. Although it's interesting that apparently the special theory of relativity was uh, critiqued when it was introduced on the grounds of its uh, experimental deficits. Rumored that the Paris Opera was not big enough for him. And on one occasion, he was uh, heard uttering, they would give him applause and flowers, and he, he would say, I'm, but I'm not a ballerina, please, I'm not a, I'm not a ballerina. Um, socialites would uh, uh, send their servants ahead of time to reserve seats at the Collège de France, where he was known as being a wonderful uh, orator. So with all this evidence about this, this you know, great, great philosopher, why is it that we hadn't heard about the, the debate with the other person who's considered to be the, one of the most important thinkers of the 20th uh, century? Okay. 
so um, as I continued with my research, I realized that from 1922, we needed to go back to 1911. And that's really when some of these issues first started appearing. And from Paris, um, we had to go to Bologna. And when Einstein arrived in Paris, his, his visit was very sensitive politically because France and Germany were still recoiling from the First World War. And uh, Einstein was already a, a star and he didn't tell people where he was staying in Paris. There were journalists waiting for him at the Gare du Nord. He decided to descend on the other side of the tracks so that no one would see him. And, uh, and there's a document that he laughed uh, um, uh, like a child uh, because he was able to evade the, the film and the, and, and the journalist. The situation in Bologna was, was less um, exciting. It was, it was a meeting of, of philosophers, a scientific congress of, um, of philosophers. But Bergson attended the, the conference and he gave, um, um, he went to some of the lectures, but by far there was a lecture that stole the show. And that one was a lecture by, by Paul Langevin. Paul Langevin. And Paul Langevin, Einstein once said that if he hadn't invented the theory of relativity, Paul Langevin would have done it himself. He was extremely, they were extremely close, they liked each other, they were friends. And Paul Langevin developed what is known as the twin paradox, which is the story that you may, may remember from high school in which you have two twins on Earth and one of them takes off on a spaceship, travels at speeds closer to the speed of light and therefore time slow, slow, slows down for him and he ages less rapidly than the twin at home. So when he comes back, he sees uh, uh, he's basically in a time, in a time travel machine. And Paul Langevin was the first one to come up with, with a story. It wasn't called The Twin Paradox in 1911. It took a while uh, for it to, to get that name. And here's a photograph of Langevin with Einstein. Uh, both men were also very involved politically, uh, leftist, um, um, Langevin communist, and um, uh, part of a scientific family. His daughter, everybody, was important. They had problems, obviously, during the uh, Vichy uh, regime in France uh, because of being Jewish and also their political convictions. So Langevin gave a stunning talk and, and as I mentioned this is, a, this is a, um, a conference of philosophers and Langevin is a scientist. Of no serious, the point Jelma's making is that <clears throat> physics is uh, an activity that relies on essentially deploying a positivist methodology. It's not that um, physicists are by definition, or scientists are by definition, positivists philosophically, that's, that's different. Physicist. And he went up to the audience and he said, he asked, who amongst you here would like to travel in time, get on a time machine? Um, he said, he actually referenced the projectile of, uh, of Jules Verne. He said, who would take two years of your life to travel in this projectile close to the speed of light and come back and see, see the world um, uh, 200 years later? And uh, this obviously you know, caused, caused a, a huge uh, stir. He went through the science of relativity that permitted that and he said very confidently, he said, the most definitely established facts of science permit us to ascertain that that would happen, that if you got on this projectile, you would uh, age less rapidly than the person who remained on Earth, so therefore you would come back and see Earth 200 years uh, later in the, in, the, in the future. And as if that wasn't exciting in, in enough, he also said, you know, what about the fountain of youth? Uh, if, if uh, in order to not age, all you have to do and, and the words he used was to, to become agitated, you know, which was a reference to moving really, really, really quickly. The problem was that in the audience was Bergson, and he was listening to these stories, and he got very irritated by how scientists tended to mix fact and fiction. And from that moment on, it took him 10 years to write a response to these kinds of stories and, and, and to Einstein. He would publish a book shortly after meeting the physicist in April 6, 1922, 
called Duration and Simultaneity, Durée and Simultaneité, which was a very controversial book and which we now remember as being, having made obvious mistakes in the interpretation of relativity. But one of the things that I do in my research is I trace the, um, the history and, and note how two, two very interesting uh, exceptions to that, to that um, general story. And one of them is that Bergson himself never contested any of the facts of relativity. And he also did not uh, think of himself as making an intervention in physics. His uh, intervention was a philosophical one in which he wanted readers to follow Einstein's theory with pen and, 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 and paper. It was a difficult book with equations to go through the equations and to figure out what was really ascertained and what could really be seen uh, from the experiments and which was more fantastical. Um, but, but the way the book, the book is a fascinating book if, if, if you want, want to uh, go through it, but the, the book described one of the twins, the traveling twin, as a, uh, as a phantom. Sunday that feels backward to me, logical positivism was developed because philosophers were impressed with science and unimpressed with the trajectory of philosophy. How is that, how is that backwards? No, no, no. The, the point is that engaging in physics uh, relies upon a positivist methodology. Because you have, to, you have to posit the elements about which you are making determinations. Calling it positivist methodology makes it seem like positivism came first. Yeah, but you, you know better than that, though I don't need to explain that to you. Like, we, we can retroactively describe something in, in certain terms that make sense of it. We don't, we don't need to use the terms they were using at the time prior to. Like, like that's, that's indeed what... Like, like po I, I'm too tired for this. It's, it's kind of a silly objection. And that is one of the reasons why many read the book as having been mistaken and being an irrational book. But it is important to remember that Bergson's point was philosophical. He wanted to... Like, like for example, like the verificationism that's sort of intrinsic to positivism, right? Like, that's, that's something that you do in physics. That's not something that's really amenable to all types of philosophical inquiry. Um, so insofar as you're doing physics and you're engaging in that, like that's a positivist methodology. It's a methodology you can describe as being positivistic. That doesn't mean it has always been called positivist. That's not the claim being made. Distinguish what he called the really re real from, from, the, from the science. Einstein uh, himself read, read the book and we have evidence of two different ways in which he talked about it. And one is the private way and the other one's the public way. Um, and in private, he wrote in, in, in his uh, journal, he was going to Japan um, uh, after, after being in France and he w got woken up in the morning because the sailors were cleaning the decks. And, uh, and that was the time that he took to read, to read the book. Uh, and, and there he says that Bergson, that he considered that Bergson had fully grasped the essence of, of relativity. But then in, 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 uh, in public, he wrote many letters uh, saying that Bergson had been mistaken. So this is where we see uh, this, this debate and that Bergson did not understand certain aspects of, uh, of science. Yeah, one of the things you learned from this book is that Einstein was kind of a shit. <laughs> it's... It's, uh, he's, he was not, he was not physics Dumbledore. But it turns out that, um, that... He also has an undue, re uh, an undue rep uh, reputation of being a pacifist. Um, but he's literally the one who recommended to the president, hey, uh, we need to, we need to get these, we need to get our hands on this uranium ore now, because we're going to be able to make bombs that can take out an entire city. Langevin and Bergson. Bergson, um, when he talked about the theory of relativity... I got a physicist in the house? Who? Who are we talking to? Is it a tapioca weasel? He'd like to remind the people of the work of H.G. Wells and the time travel machine. So Bergson very explicitly brought in these uh, um, uh, precedents in science fiction. But the other person who was fascinated with science fiction had been Einstein as a young man, as a child. Around the age of 12, he remembers reading 
time travel stories with what he describes as breathless attention. And Einstein is well known for having come up with a thought experiment. In German, it's the Gedanken experiment, and that led to his, his um, wonderful work. And I'll describe a little bit what the thought, thought experiment is. Um, so this, so the, in, this, in this thought experiment, we have Einstein thinking of himself traveling along a beam of light. Sometimes this, historians describe this as the, the light beam rider. And this is from his autobiography, where he says, after 10 years of, of, of uh, reflection, such a principle resulted from a paradox upon which I had already hit at the age of 16. And he says, I pursue a beam of light with the velocity C, the velocity of light in a vacuum, and so that goes on. Then he says, the germ of the special relativity theory is already contained in this paradox. Other translations do say that it's the kernel of the, spe the, the, the special relativity that um, are, are in, this, in this. So what happens when you pursue a, a beam of light? This is a movie from 1924. Wait, you can't see anything. Hang on, hang on. Wait, this will not do. Unacceptable. Say that it's the kernel of the, spe the, the, the special relativity that um, are, are in, kernel. This, in this. So what happens when it's you an angel. A, a beam of light? This is a, this is a movie from 1924. Racing forward at tremendous speed, he flies backward through the centuries. He looks behind and finds Shia LaBeouf. Describe, go back, go back to that. So, what, so, so, what this uh, little movie is showing, and that's a, a film called the Einstein Relativity Film, is what happens if you travel at speeds faster than that of light. So, because uh, since the the 17th century, people had noticed that that the the speed of light took time to be transmitted. The light rays actually take time to reach your eyes. So, when we look at the sun, the sun is eight year, eight minutes in the past. If you look at J Jupiter, that's around 54 minutes in the past, and Uranus is more than two hours in the past. But what um, scientists started to wonder is what happens if, how does the Earth look to someone who's so far that the present light waves have not yet reached them? So they are able to see the Earth in the past, just as we can see whenever we look at the sun, we're already seeing the sun in the past. So the speculations, what, what, what uh, a number of writers speculated was what happens if you travel faster than, than the speed of light and you can see the world play in reverse, the history of the world uh, play in reverse. And the more that you hop, the farther away that you go. You have to have a, a large telescope uh, in order to, to look back on, on Earth. So it turns out that this idea of, um, of uh, chasing a light beam was part of the scientific culture of the late 19th century, and it started in the mid in the mid 19th century. It wasn't um, Einstein's only idea. So this is again. I'll show the movie. That's the bullet that's being shot to overtake. Um, the Sorry, hang on. I was muted. 19th century. It wasn't um, again. I'll show the movie. That's the bullet that's being shot to overtake. Shia LaBeouf. Um, those are the light waves from coming out from Earth, and that's a bullet that, uh, that's overtaking them. So that's traveling fast. Who is the speaker? This is uh, Jimena Canals. 
the speed of light. She's the author of The Physicist and the Philosopher Einstein Bergson and the Debate that Changed Our Understanding of Time. And it could go to any moment of history whatsoever. They chose to stop in 1492, turn around. That's where they find, in 1492, Columbus uh, discovering America. So these are the other people who talked about uh, that trope. This one is a book by Aaron Bernstein, and it is through those stories that Einstein, uh, that Einstein read those stories. The, they're the stories that he described as reading with bre breathless attention. And Bernstein took them from other authors, which, which I, I will mention. Uh, he, in particular, was uh, obsessed with, with going back and seeing the world at the time of Abraham. Uh, this one's from Richard uh, Proctor, an astronomer, the other worlds than ours, and he continued to think about really, you know, in, in more minute de detail, how would this actually happen? And, uh, and he said, well, there's something, one thing that is a little bit complicated is that the Earth spins around. So yes, it's emitting all these light waves, but they're going to get a little bit jumbled up when they reach a distant, a distant star, but still you could you know, potentially uh, uh, decode them. This one's my favorite, Lumen, by Camille Flammarion. And, and there he describes this um, uh, spirit that can travel faster than the speed of light. And uh, Cam, um, Camille Flammarion, he's obsessed with the Battle of Waterloo. And he really, he, he's obsessed with trying to see it play in reverse and to see Napoleon at the end take the throne instead of lose, lose the battle. And to see soldiers waking up from the, the, the dead, from the, from the ranks. He calls it a Waterloo of the afterlife. And, uh, and he also dreams of of traveling exactly at the, at the speed of light so you can take a snapshot of the favorite moment in, 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 in your life, find it in this great library. Um, uh, Bernstein called it, called it the cosmic postal service and just travel at the same speed so you would have a frozen image of the most wonderful uh, moment, moment in your life. All of these authors um, um, speculated or, or knew the, that in world history, the only thing that would go undetected would be things that happened in the dark, because no light wave uh, could, could be escaped, which is, had a very a, a, a moral argument. The original author is Felix Everty in 1846, and he wrote anonymously, Die Gestirne und die Weltgeschichte. So history is a vast archive where every light wave that has escaped in Earth can potentially be recaptured. Camille Flammarion even speculated that somewhere in the universe there would be a planet, a rotating planet, that had a photosensitive surface. And in it, as the planet rotated, all of world history would be recorded. And you could basically go back to the planet and figure out uh, everything that had ever uh, happened, like a, a phonograph um, uh, technology. But Einstein's stories were not identical to those of his predecessors to those that had fascinated him as a child. Einstein made one essential difference to the stories, and that is that nothing can ever travel faster than the speed of light. So uh, he, he, he said, you know, if, if, if I'm chasing a light beam, um, um, there's no such thing that these authors were, were describing on the basis of experience nor according to Maxwell's equation. He found no evidence no possibility for ever traveling faster than the speed of light. Therefore, those stories, those time travel stories, would not work as, as they did. The other way of traveling in time would have to be the one described by Langevin in the, twin, in the twin paradox, which is about aging more slowly if you go at speeds close to that of light. The more you move, the less you age. Um, so he came up with this this insight, which is the basic insight of relativity theory. I should, if I pursue a, a, a beam of light, I should observe such a beam of light as an electromagnetic field at rest, though spatially oscillating. And I've got a little video uh, for you. He's chasing. <laughs> So 
So this is uh, an illustration of one of the main characteristics of light, and that is that it's invariant, that it is independent of the source of its motion, and that therefore leads to the effects of relativity theory, the most stunning of which are time dilation and length dilation, that time uh, um, expands uh, according to, to the velocity and length as well. Uh, and masses, of course, increase. And all this is, is in the, from the special theory of relativity. So Einstein, um, um, when he first published the beginning of the theory of relativity, was 1905. Almost nobody cared about it. He then completed, um, uh, worked further in it, and developed the general theory of relativity, uh, which, which is a more comprehensive, and, and that gave more importance to the special theory of relativity, but still nobody cared about it. Um, he completed this at the end of 1915. And in 1916, in order to try to get more people interested, he actually wrote a popular book, uh, a book for, for, for the reader, where he described, it, uh, described the purpose of the book. He didn't describe it as something that would revolutionize everyday notions of, of space and time, but he, he, he described it as giving, giving a reader some happy hours. Uh, and those are the famous stories where you see, where you, you've read and uh, you, you probably were taught in, in high school of being in the train carriage and seeing a flash of light here and a flash of light uh, there and, um, and, and being inside an elevator and all these very evocative uh, thought experiments that make him famous. But in 1919, he had a huge break and this came with a eclipse expedition that was organized by British British astronomers, Britters. and that's the moment where Einstein became a, a Oh, those British astronomers. Um, but there was one problem. What, what the eclipse me expedition measured was the bending of light by the power of gravity. And that is something that's related to... Britters apparently being a short and cute nickname for girls whose names are Brittany. A lot of Brittany's in uh, astronomy, apparently. Theory of relativity, but very uh, um, uh, different to go from that to go to, from from that insight to, to go all the way to the twin paradox. It requires a lot of work, and there were still three people, the ones that I call the three Henrys, who were not convinced that Einstein's work would lead us to have to change our everyday notions of space and time, and that was um, um, uh, the, the thing that they did not want to let go. They completely accepted the theory. They completely accepted all the experimental results. Hendrik Lorentz, Lorentz was a Dutch physicist. He came up with the equations that Einstein used in his special relativity paper. Henri Poincaré was one of the most renowned uh, physicists in, in, in France. And there was, of course, Henri Bergson. And all of these men were in conversation uh, with, with each other, and they remained unconvinced that one needed to go take that further, further step. Uh, and this is what happened in 1922, where all these ideas just came, came to, to a head. So in 1922, we have at the Société Française de, de Philosophie, we have Einstein presenting his theory, and Bergson is in the audience. Langevin, in some of the, the um, uh, descriptions, is um, shown as whispering uh, ideas, <laughs> whispering answers to Einstein, whose French was really not, not that great. And in the audience is Henri Bergson. And Einstein utters this phrase that served as a detonator uh, for, for the debate, and he said, il n'y a donc pas un temps de philosophe, basically, could be translated as the time of the philosophers does not exist. And here he was, in, <laughs> he was face to face with one of the most important intellectuals of, of the era. Uh, Einstein, uh, Bergson responded in, in with about half an hour, and much of it was later expanded and repeated in his book, Duration and Simultaneity. And what, is, what, what was Bergson's uh, response? So, so Bergson wanted a notion of time that um, included new things emerging from in, into, into, into the world. And Einstein was content with thinking that time was what clocks measured. And therefore, any other notion of time, including a philosophical notion of time, 
was really not real, uh, was not objective, was the words that, that he used. Um, Bergson, on the contrary, wanted to go to a more basic, more human notion of time. And this is a quote from, from the way that, that he responded. He said, you know, irritated by the idea that one would measure time with clocks and that cl clocks would explain time in, in its entirety, he said, you know, if we didn't have a prior notion of time, clocks would be bits of machinery with which we would amuse ourselves. They would not be employed in classifying events, and the word events here is very, is very uh, important. They would exist for their own sake and not serve us. So he also wanted to think of clocks as servants for larger purposes, and instruments in general, scientific instruments, as servants. They would lose the raison d'etre for the theoretician of relativity as for everybody else, for he too calls them in only to designate the time of an event. And later in the book, uh, uh, when, he, when Bergson was asked to, to explain time, he said, what is time? Time is action itself. Time is the emergence of something new via action. And um, recently, Einstein's uh, theory has received quite a bit of you know, criticism or, or is widely acknowledged for not no. explaining the flow we're going to pause it here, first of all, because I'm crashing incredibly hard and I want to be alert for this. Uh, secondly, because we're hitting the hour and I'm going to continue this either tomorrow or the day after. But I'm going to note one of my immediate problems with Bergson's critique of the spatialization of time itself. And it's probably something he addresses here, so I'll, in uh, Matter and Memory, so I'll let you all know when I come across that. But uh, to put it briefly, it's, it's this. So... Bergson critiques notions of time that spatialize it. So his critique of Kant's distinction between space and time is that Kant conceives of time as the sequence of thoughts as, 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 they, as they build upon and relate to one another, right? So he conceives of time as a continuum in which you can have Thoughts, events, arrayed next to each other. So that when you're talking about the future, you're talking about events arrayed on this side of the present. Talking about the past, you're talking about events arrayed on this side of the present. And the problem is, is that this notion of time is essentially space. It's essentially a spatial manifold. He calls space uh, pure homogeneity, right? The only distinction um, in, in like, a, a spatial distinction is a distinction essentially without any qualitative distinction whatsoever. Whereas time, or more accurately, like, the stuff that goes on in your head, experience, like your psychology, that's pure, like, the, the, the area of mind is pure heterogeneity. No two things are alike, no things repeat. There's just an ever-changing present ever-changing. It's never the same. Here's the problem I, I perceive. It seems like when we talk about space and time intrinsically, we spatialize them in the same way. We hold them as being adjacent to each other. Is there not a superseding spatial division that makes the, those contrary conceptions possible? Now, he also says, like, there are things that we possibly just can't interrogate. He characterizes our capacity for spatial reasoning and, and like creating these like virtual spaces in our heads in which we can array concepts against each other and distinguish them that way. Like that's a, that's a special ability of human beings, maybe our defining intellectual feature. Sort of like how like uh, dogs and, and other animals can orient themselves in space, seemingly without like having a map, they can find their way home after like immense journeys and so on and so forth. Um, but that's one of the, that's one of the problems that I have there because it doesn't seem clear to me that just because just because this is like a, a psychological tendency or a limitation um, of our reasoning that therefore we kind of get away with that distinction. It seems like we should still hold it suspect, you know? But we'll, we'll come back to that soon. I'm going to send you all...